All right. And this is Discussion to Truth, uh, Wednesday, 5.17 p.m. Eastern Standard. I am your host, Ian Hamilton Trache. You can donate to the program at iantrache.com. Uh, stopmassmedia.com is uh, another one of the hashtags. Uh, discussionsoftruth.com and of course uh, uh, Freedom Reserved which is uh, my book coming out next month published by Trine Day. You can get that at Amazon, Barnes & Noble chapters in, the U- uh, in Canada and uh, a number of sites uh, online around the world Australia and the UK, Denmark. Um, we have uh, sabotage coming your way. The hidden nature of finance. I'm going to attempt to bring in Ronan Palin, uh, Anastasia Nesvetilova, and Ronan are co-authors on this book. We're going to attempt first to bring in Ronan via Skype on the uh, computer interface, and if not, then we'll bring him in another way. Uh, reason I say that is because I uh, last couple of attempts via Skype on uh, the computer interface with uh, JP Lindstroth, we have failed. He has not been able to hear me. But uh, here we go with Rowan and Ronan Palin coming your way. Hello, Ronan. Can you hear me? Hello. We don't hear very well. Hello. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, Ronan. Try again. Yeah, I'm gonna try it again. Let's uh, let's bring Ronan in here. Uh, let me give him another shot here. Ronan, how's that? Yes, sounds much better. So Anastasia here is with me as well. The BBC cancelled. Hi, oh. and yes, we, we got time zones confused. I was sure it was five in the afternoon. Oh, fantastic. I, that's great to hear. I hope it's not a camera, though, because I'm not prepared. No, uh, just audio here. No camera. So rest assured. Uh, Jocelyn uh, uh, had let me know that Ronan... So I'm, I'm delighted uh, that Anastasia is with us. Now, let's get right into it uh, here. Um, give a, For listeners, give a, a brief... Uh, I give a brief introduction for the the two of you, if you would. Uh, I have uh, 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 talked briefly about the two of you joining the program in re- previous episodes, uh, but uh, Anastasia, start with you. Give a just a quick, uh, brief description of what you do, who you are. Uh, hi, I'm a professor of international political economy at City University in London, and I have been working on issues of financial system uh, pretty much all my career. Mostly it was about financial instability and regulation, um, but in- inevitably it took me to the study of um, something called financial innovation, the process of inventing money that is um, very uh, complex, mysterious, and very, very important. So it's with this focus that I came into this book because we understood that part of the story that needs to be told about finance is really the power of financial innovation in our society and politics. Excellent. Wonderful undertaking. Now, Ronan, um, you are uh, author of other books uh, that have actually caught my interest. Uh, Anastasia, part of me, but I, I haven't uh, dived into uh, what you've written in the past. Um, but uh, for instance, uh, Ronan, you have uh, you have authored books on uh, offshore accounts, tax haven uh, havens, and why don't you uh, quickly for listeners uh, tell them who you are? So I'm, I'm also a, pro- a professor of international political economy, and yes, I worked for many years on the subject of offshore finance tax havens, offshore financial centers. Um, this has been this really occupied me for the last 20, 25 years, the study of tax havens and tax avoidance. Wonderful. Um, so we can we can really go in many different directions here. Let's start with the base question. Anastasia, you are uh, listed as the first author. Um, what inspired you to write this book? Uh, what inspired you to write the book? 
Ronan in many ways because he had been talking about it. Mm-hmm. It's really a, it's a synthesis of us both. Um, yeah. He added the historical depth because he had been studying um, the transition of economic thought in the 1930s, the most crucial time in, um, in the 20th century when economic ideas became um, radically different or had to become radically different. And he was always interested in the people who made them different. So one of them was Thorstein Veblen that we referenced in the book, or we, 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 we based our, one of our core arguments on his work. At the same time, what inspired me um, in writing uh, kind of more concretely about financial processes is the legacy of the last crisis that ironically we are now almost reliving only more dark in a darker context now with the biological crisis but really um, the 2008-2009 financial disaster it was a very multifaceted phenomenon um, and it was, I, I understood that it was naive to think that it was sorted out back then um, there were issues still lingering um, including about shadow banking, including about wealth management, including about power uh, of finance vis-a-vis the state, the market, um, the consumers or each other. And this is how I wanted to contribute to the book. I wanted to investigate what exactly uh, finance is doing to us and why. Right. So this is this is wonderful. And for Americans, in the 1930s, you're looking at uh, well, the 1929 Great Depression stock market crash. The Dow closed today, I think, at 18. Well, it's certainly below uh, 20,000. Uh, it has seen in the past few days the biggest drop in its history. Uh, as far as the United States goes, we're treading in incredibly uh, tumultuous times here. But backpedaling uh, to the 1930s, as you're bring, you brought up, you've got a completely reshare and the economic system after the uh, after the crash of 1929, and then of course uh, FDR's uh, uh, Great New Deal uh, that uh, that he installed for for economics. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, absolutely. Well, the crisis that we are now facing, in many ways, um, it's different. Of course, it's completely different. The two big crises that we are talking about, 1929 and 2008, the financial crisis. This is, in a sense, a real crisis. Basically, globalization, the whole world is going to lockdown. And, of course, the economy is collapsing with it. But, as you say, there are similarities because the American economy essentially collapsed. The real economy collapsed during the early 1930s. And the effect and the the solution to it was something that perhaps we should be be, be listening to uh, these days as well. Yeah. Anastasia, your thoughts? Um, yes, about that, I agree with Renan that is, the crisis now is a different and more, much more painful and much more systemic. It was, in, in some way, in retrospect, much easier to solve. Uh, Two thousand eight, it wasn't resolved fully, but at, at the time, key institutions such as central banks did whatever they could. Really, they were most flexible. They were very innovative, and basically, they saved the world with some consequences. But they they did it. Uh, at the same time, this is a quite unprecedented what's going on now, and even very powerful central banks don't have all the capacity or knowledge. In they fact. don't have it all. Central banks cannot do um, much at all. Yeah, well, the lowered interest rate, maybe they will pump more liquidity, maybe they will order the banks to keep lending. Well, they can do something, but this is quite, we are really in uncharted waters. We have never been here before. The um, The nuance is that the 1930s uh, uh, reforms, institutions and ideas are the closest we have to a workable policy um, for capitalism, really. Uh Uh, So it's often that you hear authors or politicians uh, referring to that kind of set of legislature or, um, again, ideas or theories. It's not because 1930s was such a magical time, quite on the contrary, but literally it's the closest we have to a a recipe or a set of recipes for political, social and economic institutions to be adapted um, 
to a sustainable um, system. Now we've we've certainly got a biological crisis uh, that is causing uh, this economic crisis, which uh, remains to be seen, but quite possibly can be uh, much worse than the biological crisis. So, 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 two, so like you've alluded to, Ronan, two totally different triggers. Uh, and certainly in 2008 in the United States, it was the subprime mortgage uh, crisis, from my understanding, that caused to 2008. Now, Anastasia, in regards to uh, a theory, in your book, uh, you, you address uh, Eugene Francis uh, Fema, uh, if I pronounced uh, that right, efficient market theory. Fama. 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 Uh, but yeah, I want to kind of shift gears. We can go to that, and I also want to read uh, something for listeners as we return to that. But but just quickly here, um, we have uh, very interesting because in your book you do address Michael Milken, and uh, and I'd like to get both of your thoughts individually on uh, 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 the uh, uh, the uh, uh, well uh, anyway the the Trump pardon. Uh, he's recently been pardoned by Trump, um, and so what are your thoughts? On in that regard to that, the, the trash bonding that he did in the market in the 80s? Well, specifically on the Trump pardon, I was not even surprised. It was a, a, a minor news on, on my news feed, and I dismissed it. It, it was very almost anticipated. Um, I think the way we use him and the way I chose that particular case study as an illustration is to contrast and emphasize that the individual innovators and even individual innovations are not criminals uh, by default and they have never been um, really planning to to do something crooked or illegal. In fact, the instrument that Milken devised for the system was at the time very necessary uh, for the you know flagging American economy, the corporations that couldn't get uh, the funding from the market, it was very clever, um, and there was nothing in the instrument itself, or in fact, I mean I don't know him personally, but from from the research we have done, it, it wasn't set up as a criminal affair at all. Uh, the way it was internalized by the system once it was kind of issued into mass usage. Um, facilitated that transition. And this is exactly what happened to all innovations that were described in the book. The milk and junk bond, securitization of Louis Ranieri, uh, the CDS that were at the center of 2008, um, probably cryptocurrencies that are going on now. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's quite uh, an important contrast between the individual idea that most of the time as far as i understand through my work is usually very necessary adequate and responsive to the needs of the economy of the time and most of the people behind the innovations were genuinely driven by the idea of improving something either their own institution yeah. or the system or maybe um the position in the market or doing something quite good to to uh, or more let's say positive um to the financial system or the economy it's the way the the setup of that evolved uh, that would usually bring up instability crisis or or, or semi criminal behavior or consequences ronan your comments Yes, I think the second part of your question with regard to Trump, and um, that's quite significant when you talk about sabotage, okay? So we don't think that um, financiers, in principle, although of course some of them will, are intentionally there to make um, life difficult for others or to sabotage others. We think the sabotage is systematic, systemic, mm -hmm. because of the very nature of the economic system, okay? Because in a, in a re real market economy, competitive economy, the kind of economy that people are celebrating, it's very difficult to make money. It's almost impossible to make money and profit. And so that's the paradox of that economy is that it drives businesses to find ways of not playing by the rule, you know, the edge of the rules and so on and so forth and, 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 and sabotaging. Now, what we want, of course, I don't know, who, who am I reflecting as me, as we, but 
I guess what society would like is, on the one hand, business to flourish, but sure. at the same time to push business in a direction that the, the, the fruits or the, the benefits they can generate will be beneficial to society as a whole. So to push them away from sabotage. And one of the ways by which we do it is, of course, by law, criminal law. And if those people who are sabotaging the rest, and then, you know, then the president comes along and just without any explanation, really, just pardon them, that may give an incentive or yeah. reduce the deterrence in the future. So in that sense, it's a very negative move on the part of President Trump. Yeah. Um, so go, go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. Sorry. Somebody suffered from the actions of Milken, okay? And quite a few people did. Now, the reason why we put people like this in prison, if they are, if they are to blame, is to avoid it in the future as a form of deterrence. And if you remove this deterrence, then you may get it again. And in fact, we did get it again, and we will, we will get it again. Soon. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. So, in, in uh, page 20, 23, you, you, you draw on a Joe Bain a quote. Uh, it, it reads, in a purely competitive market where there's, there is free entry and competitive buying of factors, long, long run equilibrium returns for all firms should just cover contractual impudent wages, interests, and rent. In other words, in an efficient open market, firms are likely to make very thin profits, just enough to ensure the survival of the business. If the theory is correct, then it is obviously a problem for business. Um, the, the notion of sabotage obviously is to, to make money and squelch or squash um, your competition in, in a way that, uh, uh, of, of course, uh, draws you the profits that, that they don't, uh, they can't obtain. Um, you've got obviously a, a thin line between what becomes uh, an antitrust and what it becomes a monopoly. Uh, but this is again the system. Can we pull back from this and say fractional reserve banking in itself is a form of sabotage? Anastasia, what do you think? Thinking about it. I'm thinking because it's <laughs> the first time I'm confronted with this question. Why would you raise this? Why would you think that fractional reserve banking is sabotage? Well, sabotage. I, go ahead. I, I'm wondering if it's if it creates a a fair playing field. Uh, is 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 all my uh, question is. Right. I think um, I, I, again, I'm not sure whether fractional banking. I'm not sure if I mentioned directly, but I think in any set of rules and regulations, there are ways and means of sabotaging, okay? So we cannot remove rules or regulation. We, we cannot live without them. We cannot live without institutions. So in that sense, every single set of rules or every set of rules might, might create opening for some form of sabotage, if that's what you mean. But we are struggling to understand why fractional banking is... Yeah, I think you need to, yeah. to delineate two concepts. The fractional reserve banking as a requirement for the system, uh, that's part of regulation, and in our view, it is not sabotage. It's just regulation by, by the public of, yeah. of, of an industry. Um, the way banks operate in that system is, in fact, by sabotage, because they, or any other financial institution, or in fact, any other big business... Um, they always cover out niches or use opportunities to either, you know, bypass the rules, uh, avoid regulation, take advantage of the consumer, control the market, and hopefully, you know, take over each other if if uh, things work out well. Now you talk you talk in your report uh, extensively about uh, the Pecora report. Would would you share with yeah. listeners exactly what that is? Well, the Pecora report is named um, after Sen Senator or, or Councillor Ferdinand Pecora, who was um, uh, a politician, a uh, policymaker in the U.S. at the time, and who was personally invested in investigating the causes of the 1930s recession, the 1929 crash, and, the, and what became the lost decade for American capitalism. Um, he, in fact, replaced his predecessor, who wasn't as keen on such a granular investigation, 
and and he really became the driver of uh, quite a massive um, conversation with the industry between the lawmakers, the Congress, and uh, whoever was involved in finance at the time. And he was personally interrogating a lot of the, uh, let's call them, I'm not saying culprits, but you know, key figures at the time. So some of our um, citations is from the dialogue that seems pertinent even today um, because of the issues they discussed. Um, why we used the Pecora report? Um, I was, I have to confess, it was Ronen's hunch and I was initially skeptical, but, but once I read the text, I was shocked as to how close um, to the environment of the 2007-2009 crisis the investigation was, uh, how similar the problems were, um, how similar the behavior of the financiers was in both contexts, and just how different the political response appeared to be. So in the 1930s, politicians, you know, Pecora and, and all his colleagues, uh, they really went after finance, they were focused on the idea that controlling the market in the, in the interests of the business is harmful to society. And they went quite far with that logic. They, they, they then informed the institutional reform that followed. What happened in 2007 is that nobody did the same. Nobody questioned the, the social value of business. Nobody made a distinction between the market and the business. And everybody seems to be still operating with the fact that usually businesses are very uh, helpful to society. They are, you know, they are force for good because they employ people and create jobs and uh, produce stuff. Uh, we disagree with that, following the core and, and his investigation. And we make quite a sharp distinction between the idea of the market that, to be honest, we believe that is still very much an optimal allocator of resources. There is nothing wrong with that theory. Uh, and that of business, especially big business, that tends to sabotage its key function, society, the state, and the market itself. Very interesting. Um, uh, Ronan, uh, yeah, I say sorry. If I may add to it, yeah. um, <clears throat> there's a long tradition in the United States, I think spanning all the way back to 1890s, of fantastic congressional reports, which are investigating, investigated the practice of banking, the practice of big corporations, the like. And you, rightly so, you mentioned that in fact they end up with the initial antitrust laws, which were very much, very much inspired by the theories of the progressive movement in the United States. Thornton Veblen was one of the key thinkers for that in that movement. So there's a long tradition in the United States of excellent reports, and they go back to 1890. They go, you know, in the last 10 years, we had the Levin Committee that have done, have done fantastic studies um, into the practice of banking and corporation and the like. Um, the Pecora report proved to be particularly, in the 90, that was written in 1933, 1934, proved to be particularly powerful and influential in actually changing policy in the United States. And that's what's unique. When you talk about the Glass-Steagall right. other regulations, they are really the brainchild of that particular report or that investigation. But since then, there have been a lot of other very good investigations. Very few of them had the same impact um, on, on policy in the United States. Very interesting. Um, you talk also extensively about Goldman Sachs, um, and of course that's in regard to the 2008 uh, crisis. Chapter 4, uh, Dead Souls at the Royal Bank of Scotland. I'd like you to uh, talk about that a little bit for listeners, but uh, perhaps as we before we get into that, in the UK, uh, what is your opinion on this? In the UK, uh, the economics are driven by the city of London uh, and or uh, also referred to as the Corporation of London. It's a small uh, neighborhood jurisdiction uh, within the actual outer metropolitan area known as London. Uh, this is a uh, my understanding, it's it's um, it's a it's a banking center that basically runs uh, the economics of the country. Is is that accurate? That 
it's not, no. it's not, not <laughs> exactly <laughs> accurate and it's not inaccurate. Um, I, if I can spend a bit of time about explaining what is City of London, and I guess you read it, it for what you think is, um, because it's really a unique, a unique. Uh, first of all, it's in, it is in the center of London. It's called the Square Mile, and it's a unique borough. It's a particular borough within the City of London, which has its own corporation, its own organization. Um, it has its own police force. It has its own phone policy. Uh, when the Queen wants to visit, she has to ask permission to visit the City of London, uh, which she does once a year. It even maintains few parks in London. So it's a unique organization. It's more of a medieval organization, medieval guild that survived in right. the world. Now, it survived because it didn't change. Okay? Other, uh, other cities, other cities or awards have changed with the time, became more democratic. The city of London is simply a remnant of medieval time, a bit like um, Andorra or Jersey or other Jews, things like that. That's, that's, right. that's specifically what it is. Now, it is more than a banking center, okay? It's a square mile, and it's the center of what we call the city of London as a financial center. This financial center until recently rivaled the rival Wall Street. Uh -huh, right. And in many respect was, I would say, even larger. And it rivaled Wall Street because it really served a whole global market rather than European market or, in the case of Wall Street, more US market. And when I say it's a financial center, uh, what I mean by that is that banks play a role in that, but even the largest banks are not really controlling or not really dominant. And the city of London consists of a lot of accounting firms, legal firms, consultancy firms. It's a particular organization that really evolved as part of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And if you, you know, just to kind of bring us back to the time of British Empires, we didn't have telex, we didn't have email, we didn't have yeah. all this information. We did, you know, at that time you had kind of specialist banking groups, small groups, small consultancy, who were specialists in the different regions of the empires and investing. So the city of London is really unique. It's very different from Wall Street. It's much larger in terms of size. Yeah. And it's, 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 it, would you say it's, um, what would you say, Ronan? Would you say that it is on a global scale, that it's uh, more powerful than Wall Street? Would you, would you agree with that? I don't know. It's very difficult to measure power in uh -huh. a sense. So we are looking um, in terms of the data. So when we talk about financial centers, we look at different. These are different markets linked to each other. So, that, so there's a, the kind of foreign exchange markets. There are various uh, derivative markets. There, are, uh, it consists of 10, 15 markets, different financial markets, and the services are, are around them. In some respects, Wall Street is clearly miles ahead of the city of London. In uh -huh. other respects, the city of London, other markets, city of London is larger. Altogether, in terms of size, in terms of volume, until recently, recently was Brexit vote, and they were more or less the same on par. In some respect, I think the city of, in some, in one respect, Wall Street is much more influential because I think most of the innovation comes from the states. Right. So, right. Um, so Wall Street has traditionally, and I don't know exactly why, really was the innovator, the driver. But in other respects, City of London is much more significant in the sense that it's largely, or at least until recently, has been largely an offshore financial center, much less regulated than Wall Street, and have hands for, and linked yeah. much strongly into other financial centers like Cayman Island, uh, Bermuda, Bahamas, Jersey, Guernsey. Hong Kong, Singapore, it's, the city of London is really, has a tentacle, and the best way of understanding the city of London is not a, 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 a geographic location take place in London, but actually a worldwide center that is cleared through London. Anastasia, some comments there? 
Uh, yes, the reason I, I was more categorical in, in telling you off to, to that your portrayal of the Corporation <laughs> of London is wrong uh, is partly because Rene spent much more time researching the problem, but I, I regard uh, the City of London as a very global entity, uh, precisely because of this embeddedness in the offshore uh, network in really the second British Empire, and without it, it's impossible to understand it. It really doesn't so much serve. I mean, it's a very important part of the UK economy, and and it it, it is leading kind of the so-called financialization argument that kind of every, everything here depends on the city. Not everything, but it's very important. Um, but it has these two faces to it, or two facets. It's 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 global, and therefore. Um, for example, uh, according to the Bank of England figures, um, half of um, UK financial system are banks. The other half are non-bank financial institutions, and this includes any, anything: uh, pension funds, hedge funds, non-bank financial corporations, um, shadow banking connections between them. Um, so it's it's very important to understand that really it's quite a complex. Um, not of uh, c credit institutions. Um, most of them have connections globally. And of course, they're they're feeding in as well into in some way or another into Basel, Switzerland, and the IMF. The, uh, okay, but uh, Basel and the IMF, it's, um, well, the IMF is a kind of a regulatory body. body. Basel is a more voluntary uh, body which coordinates, supposed to coordinate both research and activities of the central banks in the world. Um, to give you an example what we mean by the city of London being embedded, okay? So if you look at Cayman Island, small island in the Caribbean, it's sometimes uh, qualified as the fourth largest financial center, sometimes the fifth. It's really in competition with Frankfurt, with Germany, Cayman Island. But, um, so on the face of it, it's a very large financial center. But quite often, many of the deals that are taking place in the Cayman Islands are actually taking place primarily in London and are booked in Cayman Island. Okay, so London, in that sense, is much larger. The deals are done here, but they are booked. Cayman Island, Jersey, they are booked in other places. And in that sense, London is using other places. In that sense, it's embedded in much wider uh, context. So has this spawned the creation of what is known as cryptocurrencies through blockchain uh, engineering? It didn't spawn it. Do you want to respond to that? Um, not not directly, but it's um, it's an area like many others that um, provide an ideal holy grail for the fusion between literally a legal space, right. uh, almost physical space and cyberspace and a financial opportunity to make some profit by literally now creating tokens uh, that could be called money in one platform or another. Um, it's not particularly linked to the City of London, although um, many economies now are trying to um, to go with the idea that fintech is a, a new industry and it fintech. needs to be involved. Yep. Um, and it's quite a serious kind of a lot of ministers who are in charge of business are promoting competition in this area. Um, I'm very skeptical about that, but it's really, it's, it's a, probably today the most powerful fusion of uh, computer technologies, cyberspace, uh, legal maneuvering uh, or legal niche uh, that had been opened up by lagging leggy legislature. And financial opportunity. Is this something that, Rona, do you, do you have something yes, to say? A, kind of an anecdote that may kind of shed some light on this world of cryptocurrency from the world that I know. In the late 1990s, there were a serious discussion among some academics and some entrepreneurs uh, uh, about setting the moon as a tax haven. Now, on the face of it, it sounds like a complete joke, yes? Right. Setting the moon. As a text, you know, I mean, the argument is very clear. Why should we rely on the rules of Cayman Island or Switzerland? You know, they have governments and they may change the rules. If we set up our own tax haven, then we control the rules. 
But then why the moon? Of course, the moon is a fictional place in that sense. They will not move to the moon. But there was serious discussion about it. In many ways, cryptocurrencies is that variant. Oh, the moon. Is in a, it's a variant of that. <laughs> I mean, why do we need governments to, you know, to generate money? We can right. do it by ourselves. That's that's so that discussion that was so abstract twenty years ago kind of happened. <laughs> um, then, of course, financial centers like London. London is constantly looking for opportunities. Are trying to attract that sort of deals, that sort of activities into to be located here, or the expertise of running it. So London is clearly is is, is trying to grab that particular market. So, what is the future, in your opinion, of cryptocurrency? As I think that uh, as the years uh, go by, of recent anyway, the last ten, um, there's certainly a niche and there's certainly a following of uh, people globally that are getting into that. Uh, heavily and creating massive um, uh, mining facilities and that sort of thing. And and there's obviously a uh, notion of uh, it simply won't go anywhere. But uh, it, what is your opinion on the cryptocurrency? Is that something that uh, the, 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 the global economy will be shifting towards at all in your view? Um, I think... I, well, first of all, I cannot predict to with exact timing. Uh, I don't think the world economy will be shifting towards cryptocurrencies in any time soon. I think that particular area of economy will be evolving, and it will evolve through a crisis, like all innovations before it, uh, all financial innovations. You cannot you cannot point to any invention of a credit instrument um, or a financial security that hadn't go, gone through a a transition through crisis. Some of them did disappear, but most of them were then sort of regularized as some version of themselves. So I risk to predict that there will be something like that to the crypto world. When I I, I, I would struggle now to predict it. It's already very complex and very fragmented. Um, and the world has been busy regulating other stuff. <laughs> so it had been evolving by itself privately. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why we actually devoted the chapter to cryptocurrencies in this book, and that's um, the theory of cryptocurrency may sound quite idealistic. You know? Why rely on government? Um, politicians will always try to intervene in one way or another. We just basically we use money as a, as, as a mean of exchange. Why won't we privatize it and take it away from politicians? However, what happened with the cryptocurrencies? Is of course soon enough we discovered that they are a massive. Um, they are using massively for tax avoidance, tax evasion, money laundering, and the like. Okay. No, and worse, and worse. drug smuggling, drug human so trafficking, uh, arms dealing. This yeah. this is a very. It's so, not just shadow economy. It's it's a black market. And drugs, yeah. So I think um, I don't see many governments ultimately accepting it for a long time. That um, you know that kind of opening for any form of criminality. So, and that's probably the that's 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 probably the biggest hurdle that uh, cryptocurrencies are facing uh, before they become um, much more endemic to the system. Thank you uh, for listeners uh, in that in that a chapter dedicated to uh, the blockchain, the uh, the crypto. Though read, you will be reading about Hyman Minsky's theory. Um, we as we wind down, um, uh, uh, Ronan and, and uh, uh, Anastasia, um, I, I would like you to um, give a little bit of a tease, if you will, a, a little bit of a uh, a comment on uh, your fourth chapter, I believe it is, Dead Souls at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, uh, give, a, give a quick uh, a, a thought uh, or comment, if you would, on, on that chapter. The chapter is named, um, I plagiarized Nikolai Gogol, who was a Russian-Ukrainian writer in 19th uh, century. And he described various practices of aspiring noblemen who, uh, this particular one, invented a technique. He was buying the lists of dead peasants from other farmers or landowners in order to appear richer than he actually was. Um, so that's Gogol. In, at RBS in 2007, this is what they were doing to their clients. 
Uh, staff at RBS would wait a little bit after receiving the news that the client was now deceased. Uh, they didn't file the death certificate in time. They would delay it. And instead, they would roll this deceased customer into a much more expensive premium account in order to claim bonuses for themselves. It was done quite massively on a, on a bank, on a bank-wide scale. Um, and it was then investigated by UK Parliament. It was later classified as a small scam. Um, in addition, RBS had various practices um, that they uh, pioneered, really, at the time. So another was forging signatures on customers' agreements. Um, the particular advice was to go to a very special photocopier in a very special business park to run a document several times through the photocopier to um, to shade a little bit the original so that the signature, that it will be impossible to, to detect uh, original signature uh, and the forged one. The forged signatures were then used on documents that would be uh, sabotaging the client by putting them on a product that they never thought they wanted, they never needed it, but they had to pay for it eventually. Again, this was investigated by UK Parliament, and again, that would be later classified as small scam. Uh, this is not just a small story. RBS, just to put it in context, it's very important. In 2007, RBS was the largest bank in the world by asset size. It was bigger than uh, HSBC, Goldman, anything else. It was the largest bank in the world. It was then, uh, through a series of very fateful and unfortunate events, um, uh, what we call hosticide or, and lots of sabotaging techniques of small and, and small businesses and small and medium business owners, it was eventually taken over by the government because it, had, it, it went bankrupt. It remains the least popular bank in the UK. If you ask an average Briton here, kind of, which bank do you hate most? Probably they would say RBS. They've changed uh, the, the, they changed their name now because of that. Interesting. To Northwest, to Northwest. I think the story, the story of the dead souls. What is interesting from our perspective? I mean, there are a lot of interesting things about yeah. it. Is that from from bank personnel perspective, clients are a source of making money, and source of making money is not by servicing them. As we learn, we normally think of banks as servicing their clients, at least they make claims that they do, okay? But for RBS and Wells Fargo and many others, the, the crisis, you know, the scandal of Wells Fargo, I think, is, will be very well known in the United States. They treat their clients as a source of money, and particularly when clients are dead, they have less opportunities to complain. So that's, so essentially, once you upgrade somebody to a premium car account, you, they, you know, the, 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 the banker himself get a bonus for that. There are a lot of those. And on the other hand, of course, the bank gain from this because the premium account costs money. You pay, you pay into this premium account for suppose the services you get. So if you, are, if you have a premium account, the service you get is, for example, travel insurance, expanded travel insurance, or VIP lounge in airport, or that sort of thing. So clearly, these dead people didn't have much use for those pairs. But they could be mined. <laughs> but to bring it closer mm -hmm. to home, to you, yeah. um, several weeks ago, uh, Wells Fargo, one of your largest banks, had to pay a fine, and they had to pay a fine of $3 billion for something quite similar. They didn't use deceased people, but they made up people. Uh -huh. They made up right. millions of fake accounts. Uh, and banked them really, um, and it was one of the many many problems or many uh, acts of behavior that Wells Fargo did. And CNN, I'm now reading from the page, emphasizes that three billion doesn't cover other misdoings. It's just for the fake accounts. My goodness, yeah. Uh, we do cover the fake account scandal in the book, but it's just to emphasize the systemic nature of sabotage. That we just, that's why the book is called Sabotage. It's not just that somebody clever at RBS decided to forge signatures or to use dead people for money. It's um, There is logic in the system uh, why institutions are doing that. 
Right. So the, the cover illustration, uh, folks, is a golden egg. Unfortunately, it is empty. Um, so striking, uh, uh, striking uh, at the core of this, perhaps, if there is one uh, to be taken away, what would you say, Ronan, is the hidden nature of finance? There's many layers to it. Uh, would you say getting closest to it might be these offshore tax havens? What's your opinion? Opinion. Okay, so I think um, we learned from people that we talked to, we heard a story, which we cannot verify, but we heard the story that in one of the last meeting of Lehman Brothers, uh, somebody raised, or a lawyer raised, a, raised an issue at that particular meeting. Don't we have conflict of interest in this particular matter? Good question. And the chair said, no conflict, no interest. We have to bear in mind that the financial system, like all systems, Operating and it's a highly competitive system, okay? And highly competitive market, uh, it's very difficult to make money in a highly competitive market. And that is true in finance, it's true for the supermarkets, it's true for everybody else. And unless you have regulations that are trying to to throw, at least slow down sabotage, we will have a situation in which those businesses will sabotage their clients, sabotage and sabotage each other. We simply have to factor that in. Bank, banking, financial system, not simply a service economy. They will sabotage everybody because that's the way of making money in a system. I don't know. That, that's my take out. From this yeah, point. thank you. Um, Anastasia, what is your uh, take? What is your opinion on uh, how to uh, 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 clean up the system um is this is this a very complex question of course but what what can we do and of course you're in the UK I'm in the US but what 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 can be done perhaps in your view to um, to at least make headway to to clean this system up and make it a, a more level playing field how, how do you feel about that what's your comment there um, we finished the book with five quite simple. I'm not, I'm not saying recommendations, but points. One of the points is to, um, what we call, move beyond the dichotomy of market vis-a-vis -vis regulation and make a distinction between the market and the business. It's very important. Um, it's businesses who act on uh, uh, buy and sell principle. It's businesses who have the power to use all their um, knowledge, capacity, structure, um, against the regulators, against the state, against the consumer. The market itself is not really the problem. It, it's, it's the problem because it's highly competitive and tough to operate in. That's why businesses employ these techniques. And probably the final point um, that would be particularly unpopular in America because you're, you are so individualized in your thinking um, is to uh, uh, kind of stop the now fashionable notion that finance is an industry for managing other people's money. You know, it's, it was a movie with Danny DeVito, it's an old one. Yeah, it, I think it was called All Other People's Money. Um, I, I hear a lot that, you know, today finance is speculative because it's casino or, or because it's, um, it, it's, it's a system for managing other people's money. It's our common wealth. This money wouldn't be there if the social institutions and political guarantees that created this wealth didn't function. Um, and so we suggest that, A, we need to think about new types of wealth as it, as it is being created by the financial system. We all are part of this process. It's very important to understand that it's not against us. It's not outside of us. We're very much in it from birth to death. Um, and quite radically, I, we call for the, for the notion that it's not their wealth, it's our common wealth managed by financiers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the book is 260 pages. Uh, it's currently available, just came out last month. Uh, Public Affairs, Hatchet Book Group, New York, New York. Um, some closing comments. Uh, we'll start with you, Ronan. Uh, please provide some closing comments for listeners. I think I'll take, for my, take the cue from Anastasia. Um, we tend to have kind of dichotomous opinion or ideologies with regard to 
business and markets. There are those people who we think of as anti-market, anti-business or the left, and those who are pro-market, pro-business on the right. That has been the way we understood politics. Our view, we are pro-market but anti-business, okay? So we, we, are, we think that progressive should understand that the market itself is not the problem. And we shouldn't aim for something like socialism that, uh, of this, the type that we saw in the Soviet Union. Right. Like, market is not the problem. The problem is allowing business free hand. So we think that we allow free regulation that's open competitive markets. No, if you allow free hands to business, they'll do exactly the opposite. They'll try to close down the market. They'll try to sabotage the market. Um, so free regulation is not being pro-business and pro-market. It's being pro-business against markets. Excellent. Anastasia? Uh, don't think that it's not your problem. You are part of this system. We, we are all are system. in it together. <laughs> It's not, Excellent. that's my simple conclusion, okay, it's not just, it's not somewhere there in the city of London or somewhere on Wall Street or mid, mid Manhattan or upper Manhattan, no. Your life is governed by financial calculations, understandings of risk, investment, um, expectations of the future. And sabotage. And, and therefore <laughs> sabotage, so you are in the system being used. Right, so, so stand up and do something about it, correct? But not individually. Individually, you're absolutely well you don't matter. Yeah, you're well just uh, a, a potential dead soul for uh, <laughs> people like RBS. Ladies and gentlemen, the hidden truth of finance sabotage. Uh, Anastasia Nesvitilova and Ronan Palin, uh, thank you both for joining the program. Uh, we look forward to reaching back out to you in the future. Thank you both. Thank you very Thanks much, very Ian. Much. Thanks. Bye bye. Anastasia and Ronan, uh, their work is very compelling. Look, um, as I'd mentioned uh, to start the program, I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with uh, much of Anastasia's uh, work, but uh, but simply a a, a query in your uh, search engine. Uh, will uh, yield some very interesting publications by Ronan. The fact of the matter, look, the fact of the matter is, folks, is that the global economic system is sabotaged. Just the system itself is sabotaged. And so you've got to figure out collectively, just like Anastasia said, uh, how to uh, better protect yourself and make the market uh, freer. Uh, look, as an American... Uh, I see personally, and not knowing economics and not knowing finance, um, uh, City University of London is where uh, both of these uh, uh, these authors uh, uh, research and teach. Um, uh, I am simply uh, I, I am simply a uh, a, a platform uh, for their voices to carry. Uh, so they know obviously far more than uh, than what I do, but. I will say that a system like in the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve, yes, it definitely helps protect, but again, it's democratically, how do you get uh, your labor and your efforts, again, collectively, uh, to make your life better? Uh, what you're seeing in the United States is and again Ronan alluded to this okay steer away from uh, perhaps the socialist agenda uh, the communist uh, uh, type approach um, uh, so how do you uh, mitigate and uh, balance uh, this to where you do make uh, life uh, better for for all so uh, what is happening in the United States is a complete attack on the middle class. Uh, wherever you're living around the world, evaluate your situation. Uh, look at what's happening to your local economy. The middle class for Americans is being obliterated. It's shrinking dramatically. This is from what I understand. 
uh, the uh, poverty level is expanding. The homelessness problem in large cities like Los Angeles is growing extensively. Uh, 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 Jim Beslow joined us uh, a couple months ago to discuss that. Uh, he has his program in LA and he uh, is a, is a legal analyst, of course, but he, he, he does analysts for Fox News and some other uh, outlets in, in, in LA. Uh, there is a crisis. There is a sabotage taking place uh, around the globe. The coronavirus will make things ever more interesting, won't it? This has been Discussion of Truth. Thank you for tuning in. I will be returning uh, for a, a commentary uh, outside of uh, the hidden finances excuse me, the hidden nature of finance sabotage. So stay tuned. Uh, if you're listening live, uh, stay tuned. I will return for some commentary uh, regarding the coronavirus. Until next week, folks, simply do your best. Look, if you're listening to this, if these words resonate with you, um, share it with family member, share it with a coworker, share it with somebody. If you're in self-quarantined right now, uh, in California, wherever you may be, uh, and confined to your home, just take the link and click it, share it with somebody. Uh, the fact of the matter is, regardless of where you're at in the world, um, this information needs to get out. This has been Ian Trottier for Discussions of Truth. And again, until next week, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard, Wednesday, here, wherever you're listening uh, to, but likely on Winwood 1. Folks, be awesome.